Dr. Axe is a leading natural health expert and a man of many talents. He is a certified doctor of natural medicine, clinical nutritionist, and has a doctorate in chiropractic. In 2008, Dr. Axe started the Exodus Health Center, which has grown to be one of the largest natural health centers in the world today. And Dr. Axe has also worked with professional and Olympic athletes, providing nutritional and muscular therapy to maximize their performance. He regularly appears on the Dr. Oz Show and has authored many books writing about nutrition, food as medicine, home re remedies, and fitness. And today, we're here to talk about one of Dr. Axe's top passions and areas of expertise, the gut and gut health. Dr. Axe, it's great to be speaking to you today. Hey, thanks for having me on, James. Excited to be here. So, um, you know, I'm really interested off the top here. Um, you know, we had a little bit of a chat before we got on this call and... Uh, you know, you've, you've come to where you are today and you've, you've had such an impact on human health, but what was it in particular, I'd like to ask, that, that made you decide that sort of the, the, the less charted path, almost, you know, the more the, the permaculture garden with lots of weeds and that is like natural therapy, right? And then, and then it's a very well-lit path to go down the conventional route, you know, with drugs and mainstream therapies. You know, what was it that made you follow that path towards natural medicine? You know, uh, early on in life, um, you know, my mom got really sick. And even when my mom was sick, in fact, my mom was diagnosed with cancer at 40. And it was crazy for our family at the time because our family was really into fitness. Like my mom was my gym teacher at school. She was a <laughs> swim instructor. My dad was a semi-pro water skier. So just as a family, we were always so active. Mm. And we just thought healthy. But my mom, with her diagnosis of cancer... Um, ended up going through the traditional medical treatments. And, you know, we didn't know anything about diet and nutrition at the time. And so mm -hmm. she went through and she had a mastectomy. She went through rounds and rounds and rounds of chemotherapy. And I can remember, I mean, I was in junior high at the time. And I can remember walking in the bathroom and seeing, you know, chunks of hair uh, c coming out of my mom's head. I remember, I remember at one point after she'd gone through several rounds of chemo, thinking she had aged 20 years in Whoa. two weeks. And that just sort of really hitting me and thinking that, I never want to see anyone have to go through that again. And, you know, and, and praise God she was brought through it and mm -hmm. diagnosed as being cancer free and healthy at the end. But really, after she had gone through chemo, she was sicker than ever. I mean, mm -hmm. my, my mom growing up spent half of her life in bed, no energy, no quality of life. And she, she kept getting diagnosed with other issues. She was mm -hmm. diagnosed with um, uh, depression. She got put on three different medications. Mm -hmm. She suffered with chronic constipation. Mm -hmm. uh, leaky gut issues. Um, she had, um, you know, chronic fatigue, mm. just, she was just sick and tired all the time. And this is really the mom I knew growing up. So this went on for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I, I got even more into sort of health and nutrition. I remember at 14 years old, I said to him myself, I, I just want to be healthier after my mom got cancer. I said, okay, well, I don't know a lot, but I, I know soda's bad. So <laughs> at 14 years old, I just stopped drinking soda and probably had a handful of times after that. And that was kind of it. And it was just because I just, you know, I started gravitating that way. Mm. And so I ended up, um, uh, ended up going to, uh, go, going to school to become a chiropractor. Actually, through college there, mm -hmm. I was training as a doctor in natural medicine and I was working as a nutritionist uh, at a, actually at a, at a clinic out of Orlando, Florida. Sure. And, and during that time, 10 years later, I get a call from my mom again and she says, Josh, I've been bad news. And, and, and she started crying and she just said, I've been diagnosed with cancer again and I don't know oh, what to God. do. And so I said, Mom, I'll be home. I got on a plane. I flew home. And we just sat down together. We prayed together. And we just really felt led to take care of her all naturally this time. Yeah. And this is when I started sort of digging even more and, and, and saying to my mom, well, Mom, why didn't you tell me this? You know, you were having all these other issues still. Mm. And so, so she, she just did a, a complete turnaround. And even though the, you know, she had met with an oncologist and they had recommended she go and do surgery and start radiation treatments, uh, we decided not to opt for that. And so we started an all natural approach and she started we started juicing vegetables every single mm -hmm. day. She started doing bone broth soups. We mm -hmm. started doing uh frankincense essential oil, mm -hmm. vitamin D three, certain types of medicinal mushrooms. Yeah. Um and the other thing was my mom was a special ed teacher, really high levels of stress. And mm -hmm. so she sort of backed down to part time and really just we just incorporated a lot of things just to help her reduce stress. In sure. fact, one of the things I had her do was she went through and 
she wrote down a lot of sort of either positive quotes, meditations, or Bible verses, and then she um, she just spoke in an audio recorder for yeah. 15 minutes, and then before she'd go to bed, she would put that in and listen to That's you know so her great. body healing and all those things. And mm-hmm. so we, we we did all of that, and it was amazing. After a couple weeks, she you know her energy started to lift. She actually went from having one bowel movement a week to one to two every day. So regulating bowel function was huge. And then we went back to the oncologist after four months and uh, redid a CT scan. We got a call you know, two days later, and he just said, this is very unusual. He said, I don't see this often, but he said the, the tumors have actually shrunk significantly, actually almost in half. And he said, I don't know what you're doing, but go ahead and keep doing it and come back in a year. And we went back a year later and it was almost complete remission at that point. And today my mom is in her mid-60s. In fact, I just saw her uh, last week. I was filming a PBS show in, uh, in nice. Florida nice. down there visiting her. And, uh, but now she's, she's 60. She's cancer-free. She's on zero medications, best shape of her life. In fact, she's ran uh, two or three Ks, uh, two or three 5K runs with me in the past couple wow, of years. And she's finished, so cool. she's finished second and third in her age group. And so she, she's, just, she's thriving now. Mm. She, she, she feels better now in her 60s and her 30s and just doing great. And so, you know, I really took that experience with my mom and really started applying that to practice when I got out. And one of the things I really found with my mom and all my patients is mm-hmm. that, you know, when you're diagnosed with something, especially something like cancer or, mm. or you know, a lot of the patients that, that I, I, I saw over the years, they came in with, you know, things like inflammatory bowel disease. And a lot of them have been to maybe 10 or 20 other doctors and they just had, had not been helped by anything. Sure. And, and they really want their hand held. And this is something I told my patients for years. I said, I'm going to take care of you like I would my own mom and my mm-hmm. own family member. And so, you know, every step of the way. And what that means is, is that, you know, with my mom, I did something with her. I, I, we, we called it a kitchen makeover. I said, okay, we're, we're, we're tearing this kitchen apart. Uh, yeah. That doesn't sound as attractive as a kitchen tear <laughs> apart. But, um, you know, we went in the refrigerator. We threw everything out and threw mm-hmm. the pantry, threw everything out, went and stocked up on new stuff. I made her essentially her own cookbook. Mm -hmm. I made her an exact daily meal plan and lifestyle plan of what to do all day. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of those things. And that's really, you know, what I, what I did with patients in my clinic. It's what I try to do now through my website and the programs that I've created. Mm -hmm. I've got a program called healing leaky gut where I essentially do that. And I, I, I record videos of myself going through my own pantry and refrigerator and make meal plans and cookbooks and all those things. And so I think today, especially with there's so much conflicting information out there. Mm. There is so much. I think when somebody's diagnosed with something, they can sometimes feel overwhelmed. And so I try and make it as easy as possible and lay out, hey, here are the exact steps to follow. And so that's, you know, I know that's a little bit more than what got me into the health field, but that's sort of how what got me in the health field and really what caused me to practice and sort of teach patients the way I teach them today. No, it's a beautiful story. And, and you know, for myself, my father went through severe chronic fatigue syndrome, depression, and anxiety. And it's funny how you know, a health crisis in a family can help create that catalyst for change. And it's beautiful to hear your story in that way. It's great. Yeah. So um, getting onto gut health a little bit more specifically right now, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of doctors and practitioners uh, throughout the ages have said different things like disease begins in the colon or health begins in the gut or Hippocrates wrote that all disease begins in the gut. You know, you know, it's a really big question and there's been so much more focus now on the microbiome and gut health. You know, what, what is it about the gut that you believe makes it such an important and integral part of overall health? Well, um, if you think about it, first off, it, it's, the, it's the first really um, place where, uh, where, you know, food becomes medicine per se or where things are broken down. And, mm-hmm. and, um, and, and so it's, it, it's really important for that reason. In, in a way, it's, it's kind of for first, first contact. Um, but I, I would say several things that we know. One, um, you know, I, I wrote a book called Eat Dirt, which, uh, which is just being released. And, it's, um, uh, and I really cover this in my book. But, mm-hmm. you know, we're really connected to the earth. You know, mm-hmm. we, we are uh, connected with, uh, with microbes and, and probiotics and things that we find in our soil today, which we have very little contact with. And we know today, everyone's heard this, but just to say it again, you know, we've got more bacteria in our gut than we do cells in our body. Mm-hmm. We have 70% of our immune system is located in our gut, and it's really where things happen. And another sort of interesting fact is that 95% of our body's serotonin 
uh, is produced in the gut. You know, yeah. serotonin is known as your good mood hormone or sort of, you know, if you get a runner's high and sort of feel euphoric after exercise, well, that's not released by the brain. That starts in the gut. So mm. we know, and, and actually, there are more... Um, uh, you know, well, there are more nerve fibers in your gut than there are in your spinal cord and, and, and really um, second – that's why they call it your second brain. And so when we talk about areas of importance, it, it is so important for so many reasons. But one of the things you mentioned is the gut microbiome. Hmm. And, and a, 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 lot is, a, a lot is happening there uh, when it comes to our overall health from, as I mentioned, uh, uh, hormone production, vitamin and mineral absorption. I mean hmm. we've all heard the principle you are what you eat. It's not entirely true. I mean, you are what you digest. If we're not digesting properly, you know, and I'll give you an example of this. I had a patient, Miriam, who came into my clinic, and um, she'd been getting a vitamin B12 shot Mm -hmm. every week almost for two years. And her B12 levels still weren't normal. Yeah, wow. And and when she came into my clinic, one of the things we noticed, she had really chronic uh, issues with candida and... um, and, and really low uh, bacteria. We had her do a stool test. I mm-hmm. had her do this, uh, a few other things, and just found you know her her the, the good bacteria and microbes in her gut were totally wiped out. Sure. And and there, there's an interesting study as well in Stanford University. Stanford did a study, and they found that um, when you consume probiotics, and these were this wasn't like the top level brand or anything like that, just a basic probiotic supplement. Yeah. It increased vitamin B absorption. By over fifty percent. Yeah, wow. And, wow. and so, so you think about that. It's you know, probiotics are crucial. It's probably it, taking probiotics will boost your B levels more than a B complex supplement typically wow. will. That is now, that's I, profound knowledge. That's profound knowledge. Yeah. So I mean, now ideally you do both together, or you yeah. you know you also eat foods high in B vitamins, mm-hmm. and, and that's important. But you know, it's 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 just an important thing to consider. And so again, your your digestive tract is crucial for. Yes detoxification, for nutrient absorption, for immunity. I mean, it, it, it's really, it's ground zero for sure. where everything starts. And, and so um, in terms of the importance, it's, um, you know, it, it's hugely important. And we have uh, abused and abused our guts in so many different ways that, uh, you yeah. know, that, that, that we can get into. But I mean, that, that's the problem is that we've, you know, we've been, been tossing grenades in there for, <laughs> For years. A lot of people say that we should stop treating our treating our taste buds like amusement parks. That might help. <laughs> um, I like that. that's good. So we see we see more and more people being diagnosed with gut issues these days, in particular leaky gut. Um, what happens when somebody has leaky gut? Sure. Well, yeah, you know, leaky gut uh, really starts in the small intestine, and mm-hmm. so you know, when food goes typically from your uh, your stomach or from your gallbladder. Um, you know, sort of into that area, that's where, that's actually where most nutrients are absorbed. So if Mm -hmm. you want to know where your nutrients are absorbed, for the most part, it's in the small intestine. Mm -hmm. And what happens in leaky gut, and by the way, I I really believe, and this is something I cover in my book, Eat Dirt, Mm -hmm. but I really believe that leaky gut is the root cause of disease. It's what Hippocrates was referencing, Mm -hmm. um, you know, over 2,000 years ago. But, you know, your, your, your gut lining essentially acts as a net or, or, as, or as little gates. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, imagine sort of a fishing net. Sure. And it should allow – basically, probiotics and enzymes and things should break down food. Mm-hmm. And these broken down particles should be able to pass through the intestines into the bloodstream mm-hmm. to, where, to, to where then it's, it's – you know, your body utilizes it, mm. you know. So, so, so that's really how it should work. What happens in leaky gut is is that the foods aren't completely broken down, um, and over time, what can happen is you start to essentially get these larger holes in your net, your gut lining. So sure. imagine just sort of tearing holes in this fishing net, the, 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 this fishing net. Mm-hmm. And so now, what happens is you get these things in your gut, uh, like let's say bad bacteria or toxins, like mm-hmm. heavy metals or um, or undigested food particles now, like gluten. Well, those can leak into the bloodstream undigested uh, and your body says, whoa, this isn't supposed to be here. Mm. So it sets off an immune reaction and an inflammatory reaction uh, over time. So again, chronic inflammation uh, throughout the body. And what happens is this happens over time. This is where it can really lead to autoimmune disease because your, your body will start seeing a protein like gluten in the bloodstream. Yeah. And what it does over time is it, it'll, it'll continue to attack that causing inflammation but sometimes what can happen is your body will then also say, well, this protein is very similar to some of the proteins in the thyroid or the Jones. 
uh, or the joints, mm-hmm. and then your body will start attacking different areas of, of, of itself, of its own bo- uh, of its own tissues. And so this is where you know you look at uh, rheumatoid arthritis. That's mm-hmm. autoimmune disease, inflammation of the sure. joints. Yeah. You look at Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It's yeah. autoimmune disease thyroiditis of the thyroid and mm-hmm. and we could go on and on and on but uh, autoimmune disease is one of if not the fastest growing condition of, Absolutely. in terms of diagnosis yeah. uh, in, in the world today but it really all starts in the gut and mm. with leaky gut and 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 here here's the issue you know it's uh hippocrates says all disease begins in the gut what i think practitioners whether it's a nutritionist or medical doctor whoever it is what practitioners have to realize as well is that not only does disease begin in the gut, but all health begins in the gut as well. Sure. So if we're trying to treat the thyroid and I have a patient come in with hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, sure. I'm not just going to treat the thyroid. I'm going to treat the gut. Now, I might do some things specifically to support the thyroid, like uh-huh. some selenium or B12 or mm-hmm. potentially iodine, depending on the condition. But it's, you know, but really, we've got to start in the gut and we've mm-hmm. got to get to that root cause. And if not, we're, we're not, we're not really... You know, we're not really fixing things. Well, it's really what you're talking about is not only understanding the systemic nature of, of, of leaky gut and how it affects the whole body, but then treating it in that way, which is, it's, which is amazing. And it's funny that a lot of, you know, we're, we've moved, we're moving from this paradigm of, you know, the sum of parts of the body and, and treating one part of the body and to now just hearing what you say there about leaky gut, this understanding that one issue in the gut can can affect such a large range of issues in the body is fascinating. So for somebody who suspects, because we do a lot of self-diagnosis these days with the internet, don't we? I'm I'm sure you have patients come in, I've got leaky gut or I've got Crohn's disease or I've got IBS. Um, And I'm sure there's a lot of people that have probably had a diagnosis maybe from a medical practitioner, maybe from themselves online. But if somebody has gut issues um, in that spectrum, you know, what are your general recommendations as far as supplements or foods f- for that condition? Sure. Well, well let, me, let me start off with what to stay away from. And, and that, that's mm. typically one of the things, you know, and I'm, I'm big into food swaps. And so, uh, you know, don't do this, do this. Like, sure. here's your parallel replacement. So, yeah. I, And I never p- tell patients, you can never do pumpkin pie again. I'm just going to teach you a better recipe for, mm-hmm. for pumpkin pie and what you can eat. So, so, so here's the thing. I'll, I'm, I'm going to kind of Again, I call these the gut grenades and 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 the and the A bomb. Okay. So the A so the A bomb sounds pretty pretty well, hardcore. It is. <laughs> well, pre- prescription prescription antibiotic. Okay, okay, I got it now. It, okay, it, it the is A-bomb. the it is the number one cause of leaky gut today. It's the wow. number. I mean, it's you know antibiotics today. These prescription antibiotics that we give for ear infections in children. We give them, when you go to the dentist mm. for, and I understand, I mean, th- th- there's a time and a place, but I will say this, 99% of the antibiotics given today should not be given. I mean, there's 1%, yeah. somebody has a flesh wound. Again, it can save someone's life. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, you know, we have natural pl- placements that mm-hmm. aren't as hard on the gut lining like oregano or something else that, mm. that, that, I, that I think tend to be a better option. But antibiotics are the number one thing decimating gut bacteria. I remember reading... And uh, the Journal of American Medical Association put out an art, a, a study here not too long ago, and they said, if you've taken one round of antibiotics in a year, you double your risk of cancer. Wow. And why is that? Well, 70% of your immune system is located in your gut. In your gut. Yeah. You damage your – you kill all off that good bacteria, of course. Mm. I mean, it's common knowledge that, of course, it should increase your risk of cancer and autoimmune disease and all these other conditions. And so, again, a- antibiotics are the big problem. The mm. other thing is antibiotics are in everything. I know. 80 per- 80% of the antibiotics given in the U.S. are – not given to humans. They're given to livestock. Animals, they're given to yeah. chickens. They're given yeah. to cattle. So it, it's not the, exactly the same, but you are getting some antibiotic residue. Mm-hmm. Hand sanitizers, home cleaning products, personal care products of antibiotics. Fluoride in our drinking water kills off good bacteria, emotional stress, environmental toxins. Mm-hmm. I mean, as you can see, like we're just – we are bombarded with antibiotics. And, and I, I'll be the first to say that mm. they saved lives 100 years ago when we weren't practicing proper sanitation. Yeah. But we have swung this pendulum way too far in the other direction. So mm. step one, stop going antibiotic crazy. The okay. next thing I would say is you know, really eliminating the foods that – cause intestinal inflammation. And that's going to be, of course, processed sugar. Mm -hmm. It's going to be um, gluten. Now, I I don't necessarily think that 
gluten is the villain. Mm-hmm. I think it's it, I think it's our lack of um, preparing grains properly. For instance, nice. you know, uh, sprouting or doing some form of uh, fermentation. fermentation. Mm-hmm. You know, you know. In fact, there was a study done on those with celiac disease, an autoimmune uh, issue of the gut, mm-hmm. and they found that when they were consuming true, now not the now, some people label stuff sourdough, and it's not really sourdough, but like yeah. true lacto-fermented sourdough mm-hmm. bread. Got it. Those people with celiac did not have the symptoms of gluten intolerance. And yeah, so wow. really, it goes back to consuming things that were properly prepared as we mm-hmm. did in a traditional diet. So, so and I don't think mm-hmm. grain should be the main staple of a diet, but mm-hmm. I don't think they're the most evil thing in the world um, as you know so, some people in, in certain health communities would think. But anyways, that being said, Staying away from some of those those big, you know, inflammatory foods, mm-hmm. and then moving on to the diet that I think is really best. Um, I, I've got a couple answers. One, when, when I have patients who are looking to see a radical change in their health, mm-hmm. I put them on on a, a diet that is essentially a, I'll call it a one pot diet, okay, or a. Uh, and that's actually a Chinese medicine term. If you study traditional Chinese medicine, they called it one pot. So when yeah. somebody was ill, um, they believe in principles of food combining where you don't mm-hmm. eat you know, fruit with meat as often, or especially if you have a severe digestive issue. Sure. Um, but, but they really believe when you cook something in a slow cooker for 12 to 24 hours or all these foods together, essentially a lot of their enzymes, they call it one pot because they believe that the 10 things you put in there become one and it's easy for your digestive system to break down because that's the way it recognizes them because they've all been sort of wired and connected and cooked together. Again, Chinese medicine perspective, I don't have a study on that, but I can tell you from working with patients, even my own health, Mm -hmm. I feel amazing when I, and I've actually been doing this recently, but I've been doing um, basically crock pot meals every meal for the past couple of weeks, I've done this with patients. And, and here's the diet. It really is, number one thing is bone broth. Mm-hmm. You know, bone broth, I know you've heard people talk about it, but, yeah. you know, bone broth contains, especially chicken broth, contains high levels of proline. Mm-hmm. Proline's an amino acid that helps repair the gut lining. Glutamine, mm-hmm. very important. Glycine, which really supports liver detoxification and tissue repair. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, and then actually it also contains MSM. It contains glucosamine. Wow. It contains chondroitin. It contains... Glucosaminoglycans, like all of these things that are essential for d- tissue repair. Mm-hmm. That because and because where does it come from? Well, it comes from the cartilage uh, of the chicken. So essentially, it's you're eating the cartilage. It's helping you repair and heal your cartilage. So again, bone broth, biggest thing missing in our diet today. Mm-hmm. That's one of the, the the number one food I'd recommend. Number two food would be uh, simply cooked vegetables. You know, cooked vegetables sure. um, of all types. Uh, number three, I would say, are and fermented you, you foods. And you say cooked because it's easier to digest for somebody that has gut issues in that way. A- absolutely. Mm. People with digestive issues, whether it's leaky gut or autoimmune disease, I mean, yeah. they really should be doing very little raw. And, yeah. and yeah. there's some practitioner. Yeah, yeah, it's and now if I had somebody with cancer or more toxicity based issues, mm-hmm. I may have them do more raw. Sure. But with digestive issues, yeah, I mean, really, and that's a great thing about a slow cooker or crock pot or one pot is that you are, I mean, these foods are so breaking down that they're just, they're easy to digest. Yeah. And it's, um, and, and here's another interesting fact. I know I'm, I tend to jump over. No, that's uh, good. That's uh, good. <laughs> a little bit. But I, I think people um, tend to think that foods heal them. And it's really not the case. Like your body heals itself. You want to give your body the right building blocks. Mm-hmm. But part of the reason why, you know, fasting was practiced for thousands of years. It's very prevalent in the Bible. It's very, yeah. Hippocrates mm-hmm. recommend fasting. I mean, pretty much everyone but us, you know, <laughs> today. I mean, it, it's starting to become popular again in, in some circles. But it's, uh, you know, we, we tend to overeat here and, and yeah. not give our bodies any rest. But it's not fasting, but in a way it is fasting. It's, it's mm-hmm. really, that, that's the key is that, again, if you have a, if you have a, if you have a cut on your mm-hmm. hand, and let, let's say you're a, you're a baseball pitcher and you're you're playing catch somewhere and you keep you keep striking that area, man. It may never heal if yeah. you do that every single day. And let's say even if you're throwing the ball lighter, hey, you're just doing light throws. You're still using it. Versus, hey, I'm taking some days off. I'm fasting. I'm taking it off. Mm. Well, that's the thing about sort of a, a crockpot diet is when you're doing bone broth and meat that's been broken down in veggies, those are the easiest things for your body to digest. Mm. And so you're not completely taking off like fasting, but it's the closest thing. You're, you're, you're letting your digestive system take a break. Mm. And, that's, and, and that's really 
you know, that's a big key to healing. So, yeah, I think fermented foods, organic wild meats, uh, mm-hmm. high in omega-3 fats, so wild salmon mm-hmm. is fantastic. Uh, you know, so what's, but, in, but, what's in an average crock pot that you'd put together? So you put it together in the morning, set it on slow cook, come home, have it for dinner. Is that your, your procedure? Yeah, totally. So I, and a lot of times I do it overnight and start it for breakfast. Okay. So I do have like, it does a 10 hour setting on, mm-hmm. on the one I have. And so I'll do, uh, the one I just did last night was, um, I did a pounded chicken liver. Uh-huh. I did a, uh, I did some, um, chicken thighs. Mm-hmm. I did chicken broth and then I did a shiitake mushroom. I did nice. some actually sprouted, uh, some sprouted rice. Mm-hmm. I did, uh, onions, garlic, and I did uh, cabbage. Okay. So that's what I did. I mean, you know, I, I mix it up. If you ask, I all, mean, all in there, and then lid on ten hours. Totally. Yeah. So I, I did that, and then you know, last week I did the salmon broth, uh, mm-hmm. wild salmon with bok choy, and uh, and some green onion and some other stuff. And then actually before that, I did one with some bison, uh-huh. uh, ground bison that was fantastic. Ground bison, carrots, celery, onions, uh, beef broth, yeah. which was great. So. Um, Anyway, you know the other thing, you know, they're, um, the other thing all of patients do is do collagen protein powder. So mm-hmm. when I put them on this one pot diet, a lot of times I'll have them do a shake for breakfast, mm-hmm. and that's going to be collagen protein, coconut milk, mm-hmm. maybe fruit, and, and that's kind of, you know something very. I've simple never thought like that. about putting the collagen into a smoothie. I mean, I always just have it with hot water, like a tea, almost, sure. you know. But but it's, it doesn't taste that that brothy, you know. It's got quite a fine flavor, so you could put it in a smoothie, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, one of the things you're going to be seeing here in a few months is people are going to come out with um, uh, with, with other things like broth protein powder and that type of thing, which is yeah. going to be pretty cool, bone broth nice. protein powder yeah. that you could add, add into smoothies. And very, very similar to collagen, not exactly the same, but similar. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so, So that's typically, you know – the sort of diet that I that I recommend Good. in terms of nice. in, ter- in terms of supplements that was that was the question actually before you diverted for ten minutes but it's uh, great I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> I, I apologize so uh, so when it comes yeah when it comes to supplements um, you know I, I think probiotics are key mm-hmm. um, I think number one place is always getting getting these things from food mm-hmm. but and I, I recommend my patients focus on getting probiotics in food and lifestyle sure and, and then in supplements so food mm-hmm. of course we've got you know, kefir and uh, sauerkraut and kimchi and miso and those types of things, coconut kefir, those are great. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the other side, getting probiotics or microbes through environmental exposure. So uh, walking barefoot, uh, eating raw local honey. Actually, raw honey, local honey contains over 200 different types of microbes. And, wow. and this is yeah, Wow. I, and I, so walking barefoot, just the skin exposure to the microbes in the soil? goes transdermally into the body? Is that what you're saying? Or are you more about the grounding and relaxing effect? Well, I, I don't have – there isn't research on, on how that works. Mm-hmm. But let me, let me just give you a few examples. Part of it is just the act of being outside. But yeah. one is there's a great study published um, three years ago. Mm-hmm. And they found that people that have pets – typically have 52% or a dog or cat have 52% less incidences of allergies and asthma. Well, why is that? You know, I bring my, I have a dog, Oakley. I bring him on a walk in the morning and yeah. he gets stuff all over him and he comes in yeah. and I brush him off. And I, I actually tell him this all the time. I'm like, Oakley, thank you for building my immune system. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, that's a true, he, he is bringing in all, I, I mean, I'm being exposed to microbes in that way. So, mm. you know, and, and probably it's, it's going to be through inhalation, uh, you know, in, in that way. I mean, some of it probably is contact. Yeah. Um, so, so, so that's one way. So mm-hmm. I think just walking outside, getting your feet in the dirt. I mean, obviously there's benefits of grounding, but I think yeah. being out, outdoors more itself is very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, honey is another, and these are principles I teach in eat dirt. In fact, these are ways I tell people to eat dirt. And in fact, this is fascinating, but the average two-year-old consumes about 500 milligrams of dirt a day, <laughs> uh, which is essentially one capsule. Yeah, well, okay. my, my, my boy is two and a half, and he'd eat more than that, I'd say. <laughs> there, there you go. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm, sure, I'm sure he's, uh, you know, he's as healthy as you. So, it's, so anyways, that's, so, so that's another way of eating dirt. Raw honey, mm-hmm. we've, we've all heard that it helps allergies. I mean, yeah. Well, why is that? Well, it, but it's only if it's local, truthfully, um, mm-hmm. and raw. And so when you're getting a raw local honey or something in your region, you know, we're exposed to um, – you're, you're basically getting these microbial exposures 
it's 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 actually natural immunization. It's sure. the way that we were truly created to be expo- you know gain these exposures and strengthen and build our immunity. Mm-hmm. And so you know some of these bacteria can can start to reside and live in our gut. Um, some of them just pass through and clear to, clear out bad microbes. Yeah, there's but the two types, isn't there? There's the transitionary, and then there's the ones that reside in there and that inoculate the gut. You you got it. Mm. Yes, and 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 really getting both are important. Mm-hmm. And and I think the the transient ones, the ones that sort of pass through us, mm-hmm. are we're probably missing those even more than a lot of the others, like the Bifidobacterium and Lactobacillus species. Sure. And so sure. I think, and this is where I mean, people are aware of soil based probiotics, mm-hmm. but but. But, you know, and you want to get those in supplement form. I mean, when you're buying a probiotic supplement, look for, um, you know, bifido and, and, and lactobacillus, but also look for bacillus subtilis and bacillus clausi and coagulins and, as, you know, some, some of these other soil-based uh-huh. probiotics as well. And we actually get these on our food. There's a couple cool studies. And, uh, and, then I'll, and then I'll bring it. You know, <laughs> right. Go ahead. I, and I'll, I'll bring I want to hear this. Is it, a, is it a dirty vegetable study? Because I love those ones. Th- there you go. Yeah, great. exactly. So, you know, there's a great study done, and they, they, they found that um, – well, first off, yeah, there was a study done showing that, you know, you consume local produce. There, there are actually soil-based organisms that stick onto or, in, in, in a way, implanted onto foods we eat, mm-hmm. and they help break down polysaccharides and help you digest your food. But another interesting thing, there was a study done in Japan, and they found that people in Japan better digest seaweed and sushi than we do in America. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and here's why. So, so again, they, they better digest and break down seaweed. And it was because they're exposed to it on a daily basis. In fact, they, uh, in the study, they said that because of their repeated exposure to seaweed, mm-hmm. that they had microbes now that started living in their gut. And they said that uh, their words in the study were, it's like they have a, uh, a new set of utensils that are in there in your <laughs> gut and breaking things down. And that's what the researcher said. But it's, you know, it's pretty interesting to where, where you're living, the, you know, what you're being exposed to on a regular basis, those things become, mm. I mean, in a way they become you. And they talk about that symbiotic relationship we have mm-hmm. um, with the bacteria in our gut. But that really especially happens regionally. Like, wh- why can somebody, like, if I would go to Mexico right now on vacation and drink the water, it would be bad news. But everyone living in Mexico is drinking that water and has yeah. no issues whatsoever. Yeah. It's, 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 it's the exact same principle. It's the same reason why raw, raw honey works for us here is that – and you don't wait until you have al- – you don't wait until allergy season. You do that the entire year. Yeah. That way when, bam, spring and fall come and there's this onslaught of pollen, hey, you've built up your immunity over time. And so really, you know, these principles of – I mean, we want to get probiotics in our food, but mm. – we want to get microbes and expose ourselves as many different ways as we can on a daily basis. And just a few more things. So, sure. you know, a few other cool things. Like, it's not just bacteria. Mm-hmm. There are good viruses. There are good yeast. There mm-hmm. are good fungi. In fact, the ocean contains something called bacteriophages or phages, which are good viruses, which are one of the reasons that the ocean is so cleansing and healing. I mean, think about after you go to the ocean. I mean, yeah. I know for myself, my skin looks better than it's yeah. ever looked. I mean, the salt is part of that, but also these phages in the ocean, um, beneficial fungi such as medicinal mushrooms like reishi and cordyceps, um, they also contain polysaccharides, which act as prebiotics for the gut, which okay. help probiotics grow. Mm-hmm. You've got things like spirulina, chlorella, which aren't necessarily algae. They're called cyanobacteria, mm-hmm. which are great for your health. There's yeast like Sarcomyces boulardii, which is great for your skin, really acts on the gut. Mm-hmm. So anyways, I, I think, you know, we focused on probiotics now, but I think something we're going to start really seeing in the future is good microbes sure. and, and, and all of these other different forms that, that we have. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be pretty cool. Can I just can we geek out on this a little bit longer? Because I had a um, I had a stool analysis done recently for my microbiome, and I was a little bit lower on E. coli than recommended. And I'm like, hang on, yeah. E. coli isn't that that thing that, that you know people die from, and it's not a right. great you know. And then all of a sudden, I'm you know I'm, I'm told I need to have it at a certain level in guts in my gut so I can manufacture other you know other bacteria and other other yeah. vitamins. Tell me a little bit about that because it's a bit confusing, I think. Sure. Well, well, there are different types. So we have good bacteria. Mm-hmm. We have bad bacteria or pathogenic bacteria, and then we have something called non-commensal. So it's it's neutral. Okay. It's that it should be in your body, but it should be in a certain level. And mm-hmm. so. 
really, really Candida falls in that category. E. coli falls in that category mm. to where those, those bacterium should be in there. They actually serve important functions. Mm-hmm. But when your diet gets off base or something gets off base, they sort of start to grow out of control. It's kind of like, like your body's intelligent as well. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, if you get emotionally stressed out, your cortisol goes up. It does that for good reason. It's like, man, if you got to run from a bear, you know, you got to be able to get away. Like, we got to keep these senses alert. But if it happens too long or too much, it's, mm-hmm. it, it wears you out. So it's a similar thing where sugar's not bad. That's not the worst thing in the world. You know, we, there's, there's sugar in blueberries. Yeah. But you start extracting these sugars from apples and blueberries and fructose, and you just onslaught your body with it. The candida's like, all right, this is good. I'm doing what I need to do. And then it's just like, boom. It, mm. it just uh, o- overdrive. And it, so, so, yes, I mean, E. coli is, is essential to our health. I mean, especially uh, E. coli is one of the only bacteria that can live further up in the digestive system, like your small intestine, sure. sometimes even your stomach, uh-huh. um, and that type of thing. So it's. Um, Anyways, yeah. So, uh, mo- in fact, most bacteria is kind of neutral. It's okay. not good. It's not bad. It's just kind of. It's well. It's essential, but it's very easy for it to you know become overgrown or, sure. or to not happen at all. Sure. So, one of the other questions that I have here is that you know bloating is such a common complaint, especially um, especially women. Guys don't care that much because they oh it'll go away. <laughs> you know, but but with women, if they get that bloating, it, it is quite. You know that distant day that that it doesn't look great. You know, and they're they're quite yeah. affected by it. And yeah. you know, what, is it are the main causes like what you spoke about earlier, like the, the foods that your gut doesn't agree with, and and how would you suggest people sort of avoid having having bloating issues? Yeah, I, I've got several thoughts and answers on this. One, if it's really severe, oftentimes uh, it can be labeled as uh, SIBO, that small intestinal sure. bacterial overgrowth. Mm-hmm. And um, essentially, it's, you know, the stomach's not producing enough stomach acid. And, um, and what can happen is you can have, you know, uh, non commence of that bacteria start to grow up sure. into the small intestine and sometimes even a little bit in the stomach when, when really actually the, the stomach should pretty much be almost sterile. I mean, there really shouldn't be bacteria, but if it starts growing up in there, mm-hmm. that's really a big thing that causes bloating. And also it'll start to cause skin issues, things like, you know, not only bloating, but if, if we, well, it's, you, well, women per se start to have redness of the skin or mm-hmm. just acne or those skin issues, th- those can typically be related as well. But I think it's really about getting the stomach um, and the pancreas working again. Sure. In, chi- in Chinese medicine, um, they call that the issue, um, excess dampness in the oh, body. Wow. Wow. So they believe the body has become too damp. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and this is actually, I, I love Chinese medicine. In fact, I've spent a, a lot of my last three years just reading about it, yeah. talking about it. And the, the, the Chinese really made things simple. Like today we go and treat certain conditions. Well, well they can treat certain elements or things happening within the body. So they believe that your body is either too damp or too dry, sure. or too hot, or too cold, yeah. or too sluggish, or too windy, or too much movement. So they yeah. believe that sort of those things. These elements, and that's how they, yeah. Yeah, and that's how they treat it with food. So today, like people on a candida diet today, um, they would tend to, uh, like a typical candida diet might consider like a cold smoothie for breakfast and some cold sauerkraut and fermented vegetables and maybe... Well, in Chinese medicine, they believe that ice water causes dampness. You don't want to do any raw juices. You don't want to do mm. cold smoothies. You want to do things that are warming, warming. and drying the body. Bitter foods are very drying. So mm-hmm. lemon peel, chard, kale, uh, you know, dill, like all of those things are um, very drying to the body. Mm-hmm. Um, like the things that are most dampening are bananas, uh, wheat products, eggs, mm-hmm. um, you know, Dairy, th- those things are really dampening. So really, uh, you know, they want to dry the body out. And, and f- in fact, a great thing for candida is doing something called pal darko tea. Pal sure. darko is is just it's amazing. I've used a lot of different and things. It tastes for, and tastes quite good. Yeah, I think yeah. I, I think it's great. But it's probably the most effective herb when it comes to clearing candida out because it's just great at eliminating dampness. So mm. I, I mean, I've found that for years. I've had patients who came in and and they're following it. Really, what you look at, you're like. Wow, this is an incredible diet. You're loading up on probiotics and fermented foods, mm-hmm. but it was their, their diet's just too damp. And then, of course, sort of our lifestyle too can really affect bloating. Like we live in uh, 
and in fact, in Chinese medicine, they call it whirring and hurrying. So, <laughs> so they say that, that that's a big reason we have digestive issues is sure. that because, you know, I, like, I, I never thought that I was a stressed person for myself personally. Mm-hmm. And I gave myself early on in my cl- in clinical practice, I gave myself leaky gut and digestive issues. Yeah, wow. And it was because I was working 80 hours a week and training for triathlons. And who the heck, you know, it's like <laughs> living this lifestyle that was, I was eating really healthy. Yeah. But, and, and, and again, I, I could have my house burning down and I wouldn't worry about it. I'd just be like, all right, well, you know, yeah. no biggie. But but because I'm a driver and a type A personality, and go, that's how I tend to be wired, yeah. that itself is str- – like, I never worry, but I hurry. I mean, <laughs> always hurrying. And so I really had to learn and train myself and my body to this too. I mean, and mm. so – but I think people that have digestive issues and a lot of women that might have bloating, sometimes they're – I would say a lot of them emotionally are very hard on themselves mm-hmm. and they're, um, you know, they're – they're worrying and hurrying a lot. So I, I would say that really, hey, calm down. Everything's okay. Yeah. Chew 30 times per bite at least. Uh-huh. At the very least, 30 times per bite. Don't be on the computer or your cell phone. Just when you eat, just just eat and relax. You know, just yeah. take your time. So I think chewing and, re- and sort of relaxing while you eat, I think, I think it's important. And supplementation, I think digestive enzymes can be good mm-hmm. uh, for that. So I'd, I'd recommend a digestive enzyme and a probiotic supplement and probably getting a – you know, like a collagen protein powder or just doing a lot of, you know, those broth meals like mm-hmm. we talked about, I think are good too. Great. So how do you suggest or how did you personally do stress reduction or hurrying reduction? I mean, how did, sure. you, how did you calm yourself down, you know, when you started to realize there was this connection between, okay, I'm always hurrying and it's potentially causing some gut issues for you? Yeah, sure. Well, I, uh, I, I did a few things. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a planner. So I, I just started writing down, okay, well, I looked at my schedule. I looked at my priorities and goals, and I said, you know what? I'm just I'm doing too much. I really had to start there. Yeah. And I said, I, I know that I'm not going to stop working because I love what I do. Mm-hmm. And, and all of us should be having something we're passionate about and mission ways we're working. But mm-hmm. I, I know I need to block off more time. Mm-hmm. So it really started with me doing that. And I wrote down um, – I just started putting blocks in my week of an hour here, two hours here. And, and, and these were times where I couldn't be on my computer. Like there's a no computer and phone rule. And it's, okay, I'm going to go and, and, you know, walk a trail or I'm going mm-hmm. to go for, for like, I love cycling. So like I'd go for just a bite, like I'd go out and cycle or, um, you know, maybe movie Friday where I go and watch whatever movies on. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, who knows? You can go to the mall. You can do lunch with a best friend. I started doing lunch with my best friend, uh, Pete, you know, mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. we, we would go and do lunch. And so that type of thing. So sure. I think, you know, so I think scheduling, number one, block scheduling. The other thing is scheduling things you love to do. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is um, have a rule while you're eating that you just, man, you're just enjoying your food and you're chewing and you're just, you're just relaxed. You're not on the computer. You're not, mm. you know, you I, you know That's how many a good people, point. That's a good point. And, and I, I mean, I, if anybody know, eats I, their food at the desk in the office, I'm like, hang on, no, you have uh, to like sit uh, down. Oh, oh yeah, it's and, like, like, okay, hey, t- take, take some time. Like, yeah, it's like 10 minutes of like throw it down as fast as you can. I mean, that's that's how most people eat lunch today. Yeah, yeah. It's a shame. I mean, and I've got that that hurrying element too, like you. You know, I was always rushing as a kid, always rushing around. And I think, you know, I do eat very well because I've become quite aware about food since making the documentaries and helping heal yeah. my dad. and. But that's probably the one, you know, weakness that I need to watch out for. And, and Laurentine's a little bit the same, but we do now schedule more time in order to be able to just be with ourselves or to relax. Or I'm a surfer, so I, I loved hearing what you talked about being in the ocean before. So that's nice to hear. And, um, yeah, it's an important element for sure. That's, that's cool. Awesome. So um, as we just come to the end of the call here, you know, maybe I'd just like to hear – just the final summary for everybody about, you know, what are the main tips to avoid again? Because we just covered so much. Like, I I can't believe how much I keep learning. It's not to say that I've done all the research. I mean, I've done a lot of research. I've been fortunate to work with some of the leading natural health practitioners, medical doctors, and researchers around the world over the last sort of eight, nine years or more. Um, and I'm just, and we've just been doing a live speaking tour with some other experts. And I'm sitting in the crowd, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm still learning. So there's so much information out there 
If we had to break down just the top tips again and keep it really simple for people if they're overwhelmed right now, what are the simplest sort of yeah. three, five, six steps that people can do just to reaffirm how simple it is? Sure. I, I'd say number one is, you know, focus on diet. I know I did talk about a lot of different tips here, but, you know, I, 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 would, I would really focus on if, if there's one, one thing that's changed today, it's change your breakfast. You know, don't feel like you need to change every single meal. Start doing what I call a, a gut healing probiotic smoothie. And I've got a lot of smoothie recipes on my website. If you visit drax.com, it's mm-hmm. D-R-A-X-E.com. I've got a whole, a whole smoothie section on there. So, so just make that change. Mm-hmm. Step number two, if you can, um, you know, start uh, – you know, start getting creative in the kitchen, and I, I recommend getting a crock pot. I mean, it, it is a great thing to do, and add in bone broth. That would be step number two, I would yeah. say, is okay. start doing some bone broth on a regular basis. Bone mm-hmm. broth is the most gut-healing food out there today. Oh, wow. Um, so so I, I think that that's um, something important to do. And, and, and number three, I'd say, you know, really try and uh, – Make over your personal care and medicine cabinet. I'm a huge fan of essential oils. I think mm-hmm. checking out essential oils and, mm-hmm. you know, I, um, I have my own, uh, I have a hair thickening shampoo I made at Cut Home. It's just aloe vera gel and rosemary oil. That's really yeah. it wow. that I use. And uh, I have uh, my own homemade toothpaste I make with baking soda, coconut oil, and peppermint oil, and mm-hmm. uh, home deodorant and at home cleaning products. I think sort of making over those things are great as well. And I've got a free essential oil guide on my website as well if anybody wants to check it out. But I, I think, you know, I, I would say that's a big thing. I mean, really look at that. Don't get overwhelmed. I'd say, you know, write yourself a short plan. Uh, mm-hmm. Put it up on your fridge yeah. and, um, you know, do your best with diet. One of the things I did in undergrad is I would um, eat healthy five or six days a week, but then I had a vacation day or I'd have two or three <laughs> vacation meals. And that kind of kept me sane, you know. So I yeah. think uh, – um, and. Yeah, so that's that's an, another thing I would do. But um, yeah, just do your best and be a lifelong learner. I mean, I I still learn every day. I mean, yeah, I yeah. I love it, you know. Yeah, and yeah. so I I think that's another thing is that um, you know, make making food fun. Like my wife and I, we have something called uh, a, you know, like Fantastic Food Fridays, and we we make ourselves like a healthy pizza. So we'll do like a coconut crust pizza, or we get this great like flax millet pizza we make, mm-hmm. and then we top it with chicken and mushrooms and organic tomato sauce and we get some some of this uh manchego goat cheese we pick up at our at our health food store whole mm-hmm. foods and and so we have healthy pizza night so i think making healthy food fun like you can still eat chicken parmesan you know you can still have <laughs> chocolate cake just use coconut flour and cacao and almond flour and raw yeah. honey you know so it's yeah. like I, I think making food fun is another thing that's that's important too so that's that's uh yeah those are my thoughts that's awesome well your geeky brain and your positive enthusiasm, I'm sure, is helping transform the lives of, of millions of people. And it's great to, uh, to interview you today and to speak about, to, about gut health and how people can integrate a lot of these tips in their day-to-day life. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, one other thing I just remembered, I have, a, uh, I have an online quiz if anybody uh-huh. wants to find out if they have leaky gut. Okay, great. And, and the website is isyourgutleaking.com. So isyourgutleaking.com. And I have a quiz, and it'll tell you uh, – of three stages, how severe your leaky gut is. Mm -hmm. And actually then it, then it prints out and tells you exactly what to do for your leaky gut. So it starts Mm -hmm. giving you diet tips on how bad your leaky gut is and and if you should go grain free or not go grain free and all those. So again, Uh is your gut leaking.com. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So, so people might enjoy that quiz. Great. Well, it's been awesome chatting to you so much. Fantastic information. And Dr. Axe, thank you for sharing this with us today. Awesome. Thanks for having me, James. I'm a huge fan of Food Matters, everything you guys do. So thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks.